Gilmore, guitariste et chef de Pink Floyd, avec Rick Wright, organiste, Roger Water, bassiste et Nick Mason, batteur. Hello and welcome to a very special edition of the Fingal's Cave podcast. Joining Niels and I is Chris Cockrum, who used to work for many bands and specifically for Pink Floyd in 1977. After his career as a tour manager, Chris also wrote a book about his life called We Skipped the Light Fandango. Chris is preparing another book, which will be released next year. Welcome, Chris. It's great to have you on the show. And thank you very much for having me indeed. Thank you. So before we talk about Pink Floyd, I would like to talk about your book, We Skipped the Light Fandango. I read it in preparation of the podcast and enjoyed it a lot. The book made me laugh, wonder, it left me confused and sad, which is, to be honest, more than any reader could, any reader could ask for. But there's one quote in the book, which I want to read to you now. There lies deep in me a self-destructive trait that has had to coexist with a profound in instinct for survival. While, I, while reading the book, I had to think about this quote again and again, and why it reminds me so much of the Pink Floyd themselves. Nils, look, your, um, your choice of quote to pick from a book like that um, is wonderful, and I am absolutely uh, delighted that you've picked that quote. It sums up, um, I tried to use it, obviously, to, 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 to create a picture of myself at the time, the, the, the struggles that I was going through at the time, um, and those struggles in a world that was going through its own turmoil. But um, as you progressed, the, the quote seems relevant in other situations, and I think Pink Floyd is definitely one of those situations where the quote is relevant. Um, we all struggle uh, to survive, but a few of us um, live in a world where we are tempted and drawn to this line of self-destruction. And for a lot of us, it's a lifetime battle. You've read my book, and so you'll understand that for me using the quote there's a variety of reasons and, uh, and why i felt that way about life at the time um, all as relevant as each other but i think as a general quote it's relevant to the situation that a lot of rock and roll bands found themselves in um, i worked with many who did that point where they were so desperate to survive they, they desperately wanted to believe that their music was was worth it, that their message was worth it, um, and they tried so hard to deliver on that. But at the same time, personalities being personalities, people being people, uh, they found themselves so often in self-destructive mode. Animals Tour for Pink Floyd, I believe, was one of those moments. It could so easily not have happened, and it would not have been missed, I don't think. It was something that they could have not done and just gone straight into the wall and division bell and just divided. But they chose not to do that. And it speaks volumes for the men as individuals, for the men as characters involved in that band, that they chose not to do it like that, but they chose to do it with the Animals Tour, which in its own way was just such a wonderful thing to be a part of. We broke every rule, we set every new standard that you could possibly imagine on that tour. We called it the Veterans Tour. We roadies in London at the time, we called it the Veterans Tour because if you were lucky enough to have survived the Animals Tour, you did well. We had injuries, we had things that just went wrong. And it was early days in the music industry and we were dealing with engineering. It was a moment in the music industry where it stopped being about the live performance. 
for some years since the Beatles. It had been about a bunch of guys getting up on stage, delivering their music. We added to that bit by bit, production, light shows, spotlights and all the rest of it. In the old days, in my teenage years, it was four girls in go-go dresses on cages on the side of the stage. We added to those distractions with light shows and performances that, that, that set the thing apart. Pink Floyd led the way in every moment of that, and the Animals Tour was no, was not, no, 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 uh, not least of all. The Animals Tour was huge from that regard. Mr. Pig and the creation of the characters that appeared during the Pink Floyd Animals Tour um, were unforgettable and for a, for a man to have been involved in as a crew member at the time, uh, unbelievable. Wow. What an introduction that was. Um, Chris, tell us how you came to be involved with, with Pink Floyd in the first place. Was Was there a phone call? Was there a... Well, you're, exa you're exactly right. Uh, well, I was in London. I'd gone to London from Australia. Uh, my background is uh, I, I come from a British family, British migrant family. We moved out here. I was born in 1951, three months after my mum and dad arrived in Australia to start their new life. Uh, along with most of my family, uh, we were part of the English migration after the war uh, to Australia. Um, so I grew up half Aussie, uh, half English. Um, and in very, very early years, about 11, 10, 11, I discovered music. And I discovered music for a variety of reasons. Um, my personality, uh, some personal human things that happened to me, uh, family environment, some other things, drove me to look for things uh, to give me some answers. I found those answers in the music industry. I found them there at a very young age, um, at 13, 14, 15, 16. I was trying to be a rock star. I thought I was going to be, you know, I thought I was going to be the next John Lennon. And I picked up guitar and tried to put bands together at schools and did all that stuff. Um, I worked my way through that period of uh, realising that I was never going to be a rock star. Uh, when one night after a shitty show at a shitty pub with a bad band... I decided that I was not going to be a rock star, that I was going to be a manager. And from those days, uh, from that day on, uh, I became um, a tour manager, a stage manager, a production manager. In those early days, we were all just roadies. Um, but that's what it all led to. So I started roadieing, um, and I started roadieing around Adelaide with bands as best I could. I had friends at the clubs. Adelaide had a very active pub and club music scene. Uh, I got very involved in it, um, and then I got whisked off on this mad whirlwind tour with a band called Daddy Cool around Adelaide, around South Australia. They were an up-and-coming, world-known band, still are. Um, I got whisked up on their, on their first initial tour of, of South Australia and uh, at the same time got involved with a very close friend and we started up a production company. We started putting on rock and roll shows in pubs and clubs and anywhere we could put four bands on and charge 30 bucks to get in, we did so. And so we started doing that. We ran a massive festival here in Adelaide in 1971 which is called the Meadows by Ponga Music Festival. Um, it is a piece of Australian history. I was one of the people involved in running, running it. It involved just about every Australian band that ever went on to become iconic in one way or another. Some still are. They were all there at Meadows. Um, I was involved. And at the same time as that was going on, the Vietnam War was happening. And there was um, a confusion as to whether I would be able to carry on my music industry career or whether I'd be forced to join the army and go off and fight in Vietnam. Uh, luckily for me, uh, the, uh, the draw went the other way and the army let me go. Um, I used the money that I'd earned from working on the oil industry in, in, uh, in the desert in Australia and putting on rock and roll shows. I took that money and bought airline tickets and headed for London. I had one friend in London who I'd met in Australia, an English sound engineer, 
Um, I met up with him and literally two weeks later, uh, after arriving in London, I was on tour with a band called Dave Cousins and the Straubs. We were touring Europe on a German tour. Uh, he had a big, uh, big single, uh, I'm a Union Man, uh, which is sort of weird these days. But anyway, either way, I ended up on tour and from there the rest is history. Um, for years I toured with one band after another leading up to Pink Floyd in the 12 months, two years before Pink Floyd, I found myself working for Steve Harley in Cockney Rebel. I uh, was Steve Harley's um, main roadie, stage, stage roadie, if you like, looked after him and all his stuff. And him and I became very, very close friends, very, very wonderful, lovely man, great band, some great singles, come up and see me, make me smile, was huge all over the world. Just some, you know, some really good memories. I was working for him. Two very close friends of mine uh, were running the PA for Steve Harley. And that PA just happened to be part of this massive PA that Pink Floyd owned. Pink Floyd, because they were so big, they when they did their big four uh, stack PA systems around stadiums, it took a lot of gear. They owned that gear. They had that gear in warehouses. When they weren't using it, they hired it out. And I had two very close friends who had a little arrangement with Pink Floyd for the hire of this particular little PA, which we were using on Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. And as the Steve Harley Cockney Rebel tour came to an end, uh, beginning of uh, end of 76, um, it just so happened that at that time, uh, Pink Floyd were looking to head into rehearsals. They were looking for a guitar roadie. Pink Floyd only had um, uh, Phil Taylor uh, looking after their stage equipment. He had been their roadie for some considerable time. Um, Robbie Williams, the sound engineer, uh, looked after PA. Phil Godinski, sadly, Phil now no longer with us, has passed away, but Phil was production management. Um, but but uh, Phil Taylor was, was the only uh, stage roadie. They were looking at going on the Animals Tour. They wanted a guitar roadie. Uh, Phil Taylor looked after Roger Waters and he looked after Rick Wright. And that was about it. The stage had a red line down the middle of it. And you had Rick and, uh, and Roger Waters on one side. You had the drummer in the middle. And you had Dave Gilmore on the other side. Uh, and that was very much <laughs> where the Animals Tour was, uh, a stage uh -huh. divided. Uh, so, uh, but they wanted a new, they wanted a guitar roadie uh, for Dave, and uh, my reputation was well known. Um, I just finished this tour with Steve Harley. My two closest mates, or two close friends, were using the PA that we were using from Pink Floyd. So, they gave me a personal word and a heads up to the two guys, Phil and Robbie at Pink Floyd. I got a phone call on my answer machine. Uh, come and talk to Britannia Row. Um, and so I did, and literally, oh, I don't know, two two weeks later, I guess two weeks later, uh, I was in Britannia Road um, be putting together the equipment for the tour, which had largely already begun. Um, Nils, you noted in your comments to me that my uh, beginnings with the band and the rehearsals were uh, like uh, uh, 76, uh, which they were, but the pre pre uh, preparation had been done well and truly before that. Um, Phil Taylor, uh, Robbie Williams, the sound engineer, and Nick Gadinsky, and the whole of the Britannia Row organization had been building the stage equipment and preparing the stage equipment for months. And so when I walked in the door, I found a very well oiled, well set up, very neatly done, very professionally done um, stage set up. The only thing that was a massive mystery to all of us was one, how this huge PA was going to work. Two, how the special effects were going to work. Special effects were the big issue. It was a huge distraction. This is what Pink Floyd were doing. They knew that that album was never going to be a dark side of the moon. But they were experts at taking us somewhere else. And they took us somewhere else with Mr. Pig and the rest of the distractions that they brought in. 
And Mr. Pig became a personality from day one. We came out of Britannia Row. We went into Olympia uh, Studio, Olympia Stadium in London, and we set the damn thing up. And my God, it was the biggest thing. Niels, again, you asked how us as a production team, how we managed those that early, that first half of the tour, if you like. It was a nightmare. That, that's the simple answer to the question. It was a roadies, oh friggin' nightmare. None of us knew what we were doing. We were flying by the seat of our pants. We had a group of engineers who had designed a load of stuff that they hoped would work, and they gave it to us to make it happen. Uh, and, and we and we we did our best. Um, and as history shows, we didn't do a bad job, really. But um, things went wrong. Like you know, Mr. Pig. Uh, I keep saying it, but Mr. Pig was what Roger called the pig. Mr. Mm -hmm. Pig and the Rod and Roger became the two characters of the animals tour. They really did. Uh, Roger has always been Pink Floyd, you know, and he always will be Pink Floyd. But with the pig came this other thing, this 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 uh, alter ego, this this Roger that that, that was evil and nasty, and more evil and nasty than even Roger could be. And he could be evil and nasty when he wanted to be, I promise you. But Mr. Pig did the dickens on all of us. He came out wrong. He was difficult to manoeuvre. His machinery worked most of the time, but not all of the time. Um, it had flaws. It had problems. It had restrictions. And it ran into the difficulties of stadiums versus uh, indoor indoor venues, uh, rigging requirements, uh, rigging of you know problems in different places. And Mr. Pig, in I believe, I'm hoping, uh, at least I'm writing this information, that in Luxembourg, I believe it was Luxembourg. I'm told on the fan page it was Luxembourg. He did his ultimate. He came out and he crashed, and it could have been the Worst disaster <laughs> that rock and roll had ever known. You're talking a four and a half ton pig, full of propane gas, with electrics, with smoke machines, with lights, on the top of winch cables, electric winch cables, four and a half ton of, of cranery, basically. Sort of thing you'd find on a building site. Now, this came out, and it was designed to come out over the top. Anyway, listen, it came time for the show for, for, for Pig to appear. And I don't know if you know or not, he used to blow up behind the stage, stage right. He'd blow up, he'd fill up, he'd come visible to the audience, and then he'd float over the PA on stage right. He'd float over, he'd drift out over the audience, blowing smoke, flashing his eyes, making noises, um, oh, all sorts of things going on, uh, frightening the dickens out of everybody. That was the plan. Where it went wrong was the fact that he had to get over the PA. And in, I think it was Luxembourg. Um, he was about a metre and a half too, too low to go over the PA. And so, and there's a recording of this that I heard on the fan page, apparently, um, when I was doing that, 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 uh, that, that work with them. He came out, his mo the motoring didn't catch up with each other. Its rear and front motors didn't come back and level. They drove the front of the pig down. Which meant as he came to the PA, he was a foot and a half lower, well, two and a half foot lower than he should have been, which put him right on the top of the level with where the big stack of high-range horns, you know, the high-range tweeter horns are on the top of the PA. There were four of us standing on the, on the stage and we looked at each other and we said, there's only one way this is going to work or we're going to have to shovel him over. And so four of us climbed up the top of this PA, 30, 30 odd foot into the air, uh, to the top of the PA, uh, faced Mr. Pig as he came charging out of, his, out of his network of cables and lights and smoke machines and crashed literally straight into us. And we just began shoveling his legs. That was the only thing we could get hold of was his legs. We figured if we could get his legs over the top of these high-range horns, we'd, 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 be, we'd be able to get him out. You know what I mean? And we, we almost got it. There were three of us there, and the PA, you've got to remember that as this was happening, 
the pig is on winch cable, electric winch cable. He's pulling, quite literally pulling the PA over. The PA is leaning forward like this as we are on the top of it trying to free him. At the last minute, we got his legs over and Mr. Pig burst out, literally burst out over the audience with his nose blowing smoke and his eyes and everything. And the PA rocked back into place about a metre, nearly throwing the three of us idiots to our death, literally. But it, it rocked still, and the pig went out. And while he was out, they could adjust the cabling, they could adjust the heights. And we got him back in and over the PA. But that moment, it's recording, on the live recording of the show, you can hear Robbie Williams, the sound engineer, calling out over the mic on the PA, don't touch the pig, don't go near the pig, please don't touch the pig, because people were climbing on each other's shoulders trying to pull the pig down. If they had, it would have been a disaster. It would have been a horrible disaster. If the PA had fallen, if, if we had tilted just a few more inches, that PA would have fallen. And that would have fallen onto a thousand people um, who were underneath it at the time. It could have been the worst disaster in rock and roll, literally. And it was averted by the stupidity of three roadies <laughs> and the sheer luck of Pink Floyd to just pull off another miracle. You know what I mean? Full stop. Luck was on your side that day, wasn't it? My goodness. What a story. <laughs> I think we I think we need to pause for five seconds to take that all in. What a story. Yes. yes. I didn't know that. I had no idea. Uh, and a lot of people don't know what happened. A lot of people know the, about the pig malfunction. There is live, as I say, recording of Robbie uh, speaking on the microphone. There is some tape recording of that. Uh, but no one knows what went on backstage. Um, that's the first one of the things that could have gone wrong. A question. Let me take you. Let me take you back a little bit, Chris. I mean, you've you've told some fantastic stories there, and um, I was I was thinking immediately when you started describing uh, the beginnings um, in 1977 when you you got involved with the rehearsals, and you um, said that you were at Olympia. And I wondered, in respect of Olympia, did you test everything at Olympia? Because I don't think there's a great deal known about actually what went on in those weeks in in January 1977 before the first performance we test, in, in Germany. We tested everything that we had, but the thing with the animals tour is it grew. It was like a damned mushroom. It would not stop growing. It got bigger. The first half of Europe, was a rehearsal for the second half of Europe, which was a rehearsal for the European, for the, for the UK, which was all, all of it, nothing but a dress rehearsal for the American tour. And in America, everything got even bigger. Uh, two of the things that we had in Europe uh, right from day one, which are noteworthy, were the two, what we called the cherry pickers. I don't know if you've ever heard of them in the Pink Floyd story. The cherry pickers were yeah. an absolutely brilliant design by the um, lighting engineer. They were two tractor units, 10 metres long. Each tractor unit self with a self-driving thing, so you could drive the damn thing, diesel operated. They each weighed, I don't know, 30 tonne. They had 30 metre arms on them, three of them, that folded together and extended out. And at the end of the last arm was like a helicopter pod that a driver, a pilot, would sit in. And above him, mounted over his shoulder, was a follow spot. The follow spot had a laser guide, and he could laser guide where his follow spot would go. These things would travel across and over anywhere on the stage. With the two of them, they could literally meet in the middle. This had never been done. No one's ever done anything like this before. And we had never done anything like that before. These were huge, great industrial units. They were painted black. The pod was made of uh, steel so that if it did fall, the driver was protected. 
The pilots were all dressed in black completely. See, they were completely unseen. The follow spot was black. Slung underneath them was a smoke machine and a series of lights so that the, the towers could be lowered over instruments and lights could be conducted. Things could be done with the light show right up close, right, right up close to personal. And there were so many times when that nearly, very nearly came unstuck. I was responsible for Dave Gilmore's safety. I was Dave Gilmore's roadie. I stood behind him, 10 foot behind him on stage. There was a one song that Dave started sitting down with a steel guitar playing slide. And the, 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 the cherry picker came down over Dave. And the idea was that on Dave's first note, the first rays of light would burst out of the cherry picker. And there would be Dave sitting underneath this, this massive ray of light, the spotlight on him. As opposed to having a spotlight up in the ceiling or up in the balcony, you know what I mean? We've all seen that. This brought the spotlight right down and the lights underneath. To do that, the pilot had to drop his cherry picker to within one meter of David's head. To do that, we had to have a headphone set up like I'm wearing now, and I had to count it down. So as he began his descent down, me on the two-way with him, I'm going 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, as counting down the meters. One was stop. Every night, we got it right because Dave Gilmore was alive, but many, many nights, I know I am talking many, many nights, Dave would look over me, over his shoulder, where he knew I would be standing behind, and he would shake his head. And afterwards, I would always get told, Chris, that's too fucking close. You know, and then that was uh, enough. That all, that all that needed to be said. But it did happen very often. And Rick Wright suffered the same dangers uh, because of his keyboard intros and his keyboard solos. They used the cherry pickers, which had the light show underneath them, to come down over the top of the keyboards and really show off Rick Wright, uh, his best, his most superb. Uh, the cherry pickers were used all over. They were as famous uh, for us roadies, if you like, as, as impressive as the pig was, that's for sure. So earlier, Chris, you, you mentioned that there was a red line down the middle of the stage and on one side of it was, was David Gilmore and uh, Nick Mason. You didn't mention <laughs> Nick Mason um, and the other side was uh, Richard and Roger. Did you also assist Nick in any way? Uh, well, yes, I did. For the first half of the tour, I was Nick's drum roadie. Um, we only had um, uh, me uh, and, and Phil Taylor doing the equipment. For the first half of the European tour, I did all Dave Gilmore stuff, but I also did Nick, Dick, did Nick Mason's drum kit as well. I got to know Nick very well. He was the most gentleman, the most lovely. Uh, he, was a, he, was, he was a wonderful bloke to work for. Um, a great man. He kept himself completely and utterly removed from the politics. Uh, not one word of politics ever uttered, ever passed his lips. He didn't get involved in any of the separations. But the separations were obvious. Nick didn't need to say them. Um, at breakfast, there would be the crew. There'd be Nick. There'd be Snowy White, maybe. Um, you know, um, there'd be Dick Perry, maybe. The, saxophonist uh, maybe but you wouldn't see roger and you wouldn't see david and it was the same with everything that went on in the tour um when they needed to be together they were together but when they were separated they were separated rick and nick mason kept themselves i think politically safe at all times uh, and conducted themselves very well um, because we could all see what was going on. We're not stupid. Everybody knew what was going on. Um, it was their job to protect and um, and continue. And they did. And they did that very, very well indeed. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, uh, they were very different individuals and it was part of the political breakup of the band. You very much did have Roger and Rick Wright, 
sadly, no longer. Roger and Rick Wright were Pink Floyd. And on the other half of the stage, you had um, uh, uh, Dave Gilmore, um, Snowy White playing guitar. Um, Nick Mason, somewhat self-consciously, I think, trapped in the middle. But didn't he do a wonderful job? He was the peacemaker. He was the peacemaker. you were giving him. Yeah, he was the peacemaker. Crosby, Stills and Nash, Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. You've, you've, got, you've got Graham Nash. He was the Graham Nash of Pink Floyd. He held he held it together. I think without Nick, I think if there'd been a different drummer, I really do. I think if there'd been a volatile Keith Moon, you wouldn't have had the Animals Tour. You probably, yeah, you, you wouldn't have had it. It wouldn't have happened. Nick Moon held that together. Uh, Nick Mason held that together. Carried it on through the wall, Division Bell, wonderful albums, but they but they speak. You know, it's it's someone said to me once, it's the words that are not said that you should listen to. With Pink Floyd it's what's not said. It's what they don't say. And and they do that very well. So, so talking about uh sorry, Ian, talking about the um talking about peace I would say, uh, when you uh, started the US lag of the tour, the complete audience shifted somehow. I would say the European concerts were quite calm and quite quite okay, quite all right. But then the US leg of the tour, there was a very rowdy crowd, so to speak, firing fireworks and screaming and shouting. And how did you experience as a roadie, a whole, the whole production team and the band as well, how did you experience that part of the tour? Well, um, again, Neil's brought that up on the question list. It's interesting because and it's valid and it's very, very real. It was a different audience. Um, I think I've said it was an interesting time in music, in music history and Pink Floyd were a part of that history. It wasn't just Pink Floyd that were uh, breaking up, fitting apart and self-destructing on stage and all the rest of it. The music industry... It itself was doing the same thing. The music industry was changing. And the American audience for Pink Floyd was very different. They wanted more, they wanted bigger, they wanted louder, um, and they were much more aggressive and violent than anything that we'd ever seen in Europe. And the bigger the show got, as it did grow bigger and bigger as we went across America, The bigger it got, the more they wanted. It was the insatiable appetite of the addict, almost. We couldn't give them enough. Um, and I think Roger felt that very much, too. Um, there are, Nils, you mentioned the numerous um, uh, uh, attacks where Roger has had verbalized at, at an audience to basically shut up, you know. Uh, he wasn't afraid to tell them to shut, shut up. Um, and he did so on numerous occasions. He didn't like it. It wasn't just the, uh, the, the volume of their um, interjections. It was the anger that we were all starting to feel. There was an anger happening that we'd never known before. It had nothing to do with Pink Floyd. It had nothing to do with the lyrics. It was all about society changing. And it was a, a time of the Vietnam War and so much societal change it reflected itself in audiences roger had run in after running after running with that with with, uh, with uh, audiences uh, culminating obviously in the, in the uh, montreal um, the, the, the final show where um, so much has been written you know so much has been written i myself 10 years ago on that fan page wrote a lot about that A lot of it was uh, disputed uh, at the time. A lot of it was, um, uh, uh, I don't know, so it, it was almost, um, it, yeah, people, people, people wanted, to, wanted to disagree. They didn't want to believe it. They didn't want to believe that Roger Walters had spat in the face of someone. Well, it's not that hard to, to, to believe. I mean, he was what he was. And the young lad was a troublemaker. Uh, there was bullshit written about how roadies had lifted the young lad up. Well, that's just a lot of nonsense. We didn't have roadies in the front of the stage. We had security people, lots of them. We didn't have any. Our roadies were on stage. And at, at that show at Montreal, there wasn't a roadie standing anywhere where, where a bottle could have been hit him because we were all frightened that that show was going to go nuts. We all thought that show was going to erupt into a riot. 
And so there were no roadies in the front to lift this young lad up. I watched what happened. Roger took his guitar off, hung it up on his rack, muttered something at Phil, walked towards the front of the stage, joined the other guys, got level with this young lad, and he was obviously set to either say or do something. But as he did that, the young lad jumped up with his hands on the shoulders of the guys in front of him and screamed abuse at Roger. God knows, who knows what he said. And Roger just looked at him and spat. That was the end of that. And he walked off. There was no nothing more than that. But by the time we got back to Europe, by the time we got back to England, punk was written in pink. Fuck you, Roger, was written on the walls. Spitting on people was called giving it a Roger. Bands, punk bands, spat on punk audiences. Audience, punk audience spat on punk bands. It became a thing. It lasted a couple of years, the spit, the Roger. And it was Roger that did that. And it was the punk Floyd, it was the punk movement that jumped on it. And a lot of people didn't want to admit it. They didn't want to associate Roger with the punk movement and all the rest of it. Well, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it happened. He lost his temper. He spat at the young bloke. And it's been written up in history. It's now part of history. And, and um, I hope it's accepted. You know, one of those things and that happened. It a, what, was it a talking point, Chris, amongst the crew and the band after the concert, that incident? Were, yeah, were absolutely. reflecting on it? Yeah, yeah. We all wondered what the hell we had just witnessed. We all wondered what we had just been a part of. Um, it was the end of a tour where we asked ourselves that a dozen times. Um, the more the more things that went wrong, the more we asked ourselves that question. And after that, we all said, what will the repercussions of this be? And we, wait, we waited. We waited to see what would happen. And in the same way, I suppose, that Roger had victory over Mr. Pig, he also had victory over that situation verbally. Verbally, no one said too much. He said, and he's very good at saying very little and a lot at the same time, um, but, but he did the same thing. He burnt it. He did the same thing to Mr. Pig. Uh, about five shows, six shows before the end of the American tour, by, by the time Roger was so pissed off with Mr. Pig and his failings and his breakdowns and all the rest of it, he decided that he'd have another pig made, a pink inflatable pig with no lights on it, no nothing, same size, the whole, the whole thing, pink inflatable balloon. And so what happened? As Mr. Pig, Mr. Pig, the real Mr. Evil Pig disappeared from audience view behind the stage. We blew up the pink balloon and sent him up into the air 50 feet and set him on fire. And Roger burnt Mr. Pig for the last five nights of the whole of the European tour, whole American tour. He got his own back. Fuck you, Pig. He burnt him. And, you know, I mean, these days you wouldn't get away with it. You just wouldn't be allowed to do it. But, and it was the same thing with that spitting incident. Roger shut it up. Roger said very little. The community, the music industry said very little. I remember when I spoke about it, it was, uh, you know, um, something that, as I say, a lot of people didn't want to admit it happened. It became um, controversial almost to bring it up, you know, to suggest that that could have been the case. But it was simple. He was angry with a, a drunken, drugged-out dickhead uh, who shouted abuse at him. And he spat at him. And I don't know, how many of us wouldn't do the same thing? As for the rest of it, um, that's just another um, added on thing. The punk movement picking up on it and all the rest of it. Well, that's how history's written, isn't it? That's what's wonderful about the whole thing. What a story. Indeed it is. Um, Chris, I, I'm just thinking of so many different things as we speak. Um, during the during the tour, um, you, you talked about how things developed during the tour. Um, were, were there regular meetings? Were there reflections on how the night before went and how things were going to change? Um, or did you just go out and improvise each night and carry on the same routine? <laughs> I hate to admit it, but the last point is probably truer than the first. We did. You, you just you you winged it. Um, yeah, you called no. it the Veterans Tour earlier, and I can completely see how you might uh, have adopted exactly that, that title. Look, things went wrong. There were meetings. Yes, there was lots of meetings. 
um, let, uh, we did it regularly. You know, how can we do this better? Because people were getting hurt and people were, uh, things were getting broken and we've got a show to do. We're, there to, we're, we're paid to do a bloody job. You know what I mean? For, you can glamorise us and call us roadies and all the rest. We were just there to do a job. And the only reason we were there because we could do the job. There was a massive incident at one of the outdoor concerts in New, in, uh, in America towards the end, halfway through. The mirror ball, you know, the massive mirror ball that used to come up behind Nick Mason's drum kit at the start of that wonderful Rick Wright keyboard intro. That was so big that it had to be assembled before it went up. The last six of the wings of the damn thing had to be put on as it was under the stage. And then as it slowly emerged above Nick Wright's drum kit, we were behind the stage, underneath it, bolting the bits quickly in place for the rest of it to go up. Each of these pieces weighed about 250 kilos, 200 odd kilos, steel, glass, mirrors, the whole kit and caboodle. We got to the show in America, we got to the point where it was time to bolt the damn thing on, and we had rehearsed doing that since Olympia. We became experts because it had to be done right. There were about 20 bolts in each of the, in each of the metal frames. Each of those 20 bolts had to be gotten in properly. I mean, the thing was sitting above Nick Mason, for crying out loud. We couldn't take any chances. The bolts had to, fit, had to be on, had to be properly put together. So came this night, we went to start doing it, and we found that somehow um, two, at least, of the frames had been, belt, had been bent. Whether someone had stepped on them or whether someone had been, something had been dropped on them, we didn't know, but we couldn't get the bolts in. We could not get the bolts in. So three of the frames went up with two bolts, and the rest of it, the rest of the eight or ten bolt holes, were cable ties and gaffer tape. And we were shoving that cable tie, those cable ties and gaffer tape on as it rose, as this damn thing weighing hundreds of tons went up into the air. We were literally bolting with gaffer tape and, and, uh, and cable ties. It went up into the air. We all stood there. And we all held our breath. It got to the top, and then it started to turn. And that was our fear, that when it started to turn, when, when the loose one got to the top, that it would tear off, and with it would come the rest of them. By that stage, it's 30 feet up in the air. You've got Nick Mason in the middle of a drum solo. You've got Rick Wright leading in the band with the rest of the stuff. And the, the mirror ball is the main part. And it started to turn, and it got past the point where if it was going to rip apart, it would have done. And there were about, I don't know, a dozen of us drinking Jamison Scotch whiskey and doing lines of cocaine in celebration of the fact that we had just literally done another miracle. And it survived. Had it, wow. had it failed, Nick would not be here. Had he even known about it, he would not have done it. But we did it, and um, that's when, like I say, you said, did we have from production meetings? Did we, did we try to make? Yeah, we made sure that never happened again, and we put extra bolts in them, and they were bigger bolts, and it never happened again. But little things like that happened all along the way where it went wrong. You know what I mean? Mm. Well, I could imagine something like that. You can't just pull out a spare, can you? If no, it's bent, and the show, it, the show you, you'd has have to. to go on. You can't. You can't buy a new one while yes, you're on the road. You just. Uh, you just have to patch it up and keep going. That's exactly right. And it was the same with all of the uh, inflatables and uh, Mr. Pig, the Cadillac that we had, the the, the 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 family sitting on the couch. You know, they had to perform and pe perform properly. Um, sometimes they did. Sometimes they they didn't. Luckily, most of the time we got away with it. I think we did pretty well. So during the uh, US part of the tour, Roger got quite sick, as I remember. So were there any moments where you thought that the shows might have been cancelled? I got he got some stomach ache, if I remember correctly, and had to took many no. pills to, to even be on the stage. No, not not cancelled. Um, there were some iffy moments, but no, not not, not nothing ever uh, looked like it was going to threaten the completion of the tour. 
And I think that was from both band and crew's perspective. I think we'd all have walked hot coals just to finish the tour. Um, we wanted it done. We wanted it over. The band wanted it done, and, and that's, that was, they made that very obvious. And we wanted it done. Nothing, nothing would have prevented us from finishing that tour. Uh, things could have fallen over. Um, we'd have made it work. That's how we all felt about it. So if, if you talk about reviewing uh, each night and talking about, was it also from a musical perspective? So do you know if the band did any recordings on yeah, each that's night a, just to that's, read? That's another interesting topic that's been raised before. I wish I could. I can tell you this. On the PA was a twin deck cassette recorder. And every single solitary night, Robbie recorded two cassettes of what happened that night. And that was all through the American tour. And I can remember listening to one or two of those on the bus, on the crew bus, next day or next that night or whatever the hell. Somewhere, somewhere those tapes exist. But there's never been any emergence of them or, or admittance that they exist. But I know that they did exist because I had to pack the flight case that they went in. So I know that that flight case had to be full and in the box was Robbie's tape collection. So that went into my truck. That was part of my, my semi-trailer. I had a semi-trailer and a half. A semi-trailer at least full of technical equipment that I had to pack every night. And in one of those flight cases from the desk was Robbie's box of cassettes. So I know they were there. Where they ended up, I have no idea and no one else does it seems to be a, a mystery so uh, it was a double cassette player was it yeah yeah tw was, th was that so as was that so as to not miss something so no, one tape so that, start, no, that, no, that started roger, after the other no it was so that roger could listen to one and david could listen to the other oh come on <laughs> so they don't even have to share the tapes okay i get it <laughs> i'm serious yeah And um, this this is going to sound a very nerdy question, but I've got to ask it anyway. Those tapes that would have gone into those decks, um, would they have been 120 cassettes? So an hour at a time or, or less? Do you, uh, probably do you recall the that level of detail? Probably, I wouldn't know the level of detail past that. But yeah, I would think no. it, it was the whole show. It was as much as we could get on a, on a, on a, on a cassette. So uh, that's what was recorded. And it was done because both Roger and David um, wanted to know what was going on. They were the two main musicians. Roger really did, you know, own the musicianship of the stage. But mm. Dave was coming up and he was taking an ever increasing role in being the sound of Pink Floyd. Roger, uh, sorry, David was working with Snowy White, who was playing second guitar some of the bass lines, but mainly second guitar and acoustic work. David wanted to know that he and Roger, uh, that he and Snowy uh, were working right and were working together properly. And so he wanted a recording for him to listen to. So that's it all I know. And it would have been a, a, just a, a complete recording of the concert, all of the instrumentation. It's not just uh, yeah, would some, have, of, would some of the band members. No, it would have been uh, would have been straight off the desk. Would have been taken straight off the desk. Uh, would have been easy enough to do, um, and yeah, uh, yeah, easy enough. And we we believe that those recordings were were made with open air mics, so on stands to try and capture the audience ambience as well as as what was going on on stage. Do you yeah, recall there, any equipment? Yeah, yeah, there, there, there was there was two. Mics set up uh, left and right uh, side of the desk, and each of those mics was recording uh, the, uh, the the ambience of the, of the of the crowd. So they were taking. And, uh, sorry, Chris. Go on. Yeah. So so they were taking a recording off the desk of what they were getting. They were also taking a recording of the ambience recording of the crowd, so they could hear the PA. And you said that. The recordings were of the American leg of the tour. Um, yeah. Is, is, that, is that the only part of the tour that was recorded? So you didn't get the sense that they were recording in Europe? 
No, I don't think so. It was something that, um, no, it was Europe, it, it, uh, sorry, America, and it was only a few. It was only the last few, not the last six or eight or ten or whatever. It was only the last few shows that were actually, that, that they did do the recording every night. Okay, interesting. So, so coming back to the uh, politics of the band, so you told me before that, that uh, Roger once told Snowy White to play something different or to play even less. So do you think that he used Snowy just to uh, somehow interact with David because he didn't want to talk to David <laughs> face to face? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, Roger's, Roger's bigger than that. And, um, And Snowy, uh, Snowy didn't need anybody to tell him what to do. Snowy was good at what he did. He was an up-and-coming young guitarist. Uh, he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he went on to have a lovely career. He never really found the fame that he deserved. But no, Snowy did a great job. But like I said, Roger um, and Dave, I'll be honest, were both upsmen. And they enjoyed being the upsmen. And any opportunity that they got to be the upsman, they would do that. Um, now, Nick Mason was completely the opposite. I would never do something like that. I would never say, never be a part of that sort of conversation. Rick Wright occasionally would come in with a snide comment at the end of some of those conversations. But Rick Wright was pretty quiet about the thing as well. It was Roger and David. I mean, that was the breakup. That was what was going on. Roger and David were taking Pink Floyd in two different directions. Um, where the audience chose to go um, was obviously made, made obvious after the wall, after the division bill. Um, you know, they, they've stuck with David and all the rest of it. Pink Floyd are still Pink Floyd. But Roger Walters will always be Roger Walters and nothing he ever does will ever fail because he just has a way about him. So coming back to your book, uh, we skipped the lad Fandango. You described the uh, quite toxic music industry and, and your way in it. So can we expect another book that describes your time working in this industry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much you can. Um, and, and I'm late and, and almost apologetic. Uh, it's something that I wanted to do. I, I, when I finished the first one, I wanted to keep writing. But I had a few health issues. Things got in the way. Life got in the way. And I, and I took some time off, and, and I shouldn't have done that. But um, no, I've determined that I will write the second one. I'm in the process of setting myself up for that now. I'm, I'm mapping out the chapters. It's a difficult one, though, um, because the, in, in the first book, I write about me, and I write about you know, my personal life and, and, and history, you know, what was going on. Uh, with the band thing, um, I, I don't want to be claiming fame. I don't want to be that bloke that worked for that band. You know, I'm me, you know. Um, so I'm trying to write it from as we're having this conversation. Uh, I'm going to try to write the second book from the roadie's point of view, from, from my side of stage, me hidden in the wings, doing my thing. Uh, and that's what I was doing. Uh, you know, I found at a very young age, uh, in the wings, in the darkness, uh, there I found me, I found myself. And that's what the book will be about. Um, and the bands that I work with, um, I was lucky to get the job with some of them. Some of them were lucky to get me. Um, either way, we, we worked it through. Um, and it's 15 years of my life. Um, I've toured the world. There's not too many bands I haven't worked with. Um, you know, even uh, you know people like Rolling Stones, and Queen, and all those other bands that you mentioned. Um, you know, I've, I've spent time with and had time with. I've got to live my dreams. I'm 72. I started dreaming about this at 14, 15, and I've got to work with every one of my heroes and uh, my greatest hero of all, um, without any shadow of a doubt. Um, yeah, has nicknamed my, my, my Coke spoon, the shovel, and um, all that sort of thing. And if you read the book, you'll find there's, there's a lot of things in there that, that, that uh, give you reason to understand why I've, I did what I did for as long as I did. So um, you asked me to use the song The Load Out and Stay by Jackson Brown as an outro. So what's important about the song for you? 
Oh, look, he just says it all, and he did the moment I heard it. You know, I thought that's that's my song. I called the I called the first book we skipped a life Fandango because from about age fourteen I discovered that song, and it had been with me in every one of my pivotal moments uh, ever since. And I do think it, it, it wonderfully described how we lived. But let the roadies take the stage by Jackson Brown really does sum up. I think how we all loved living on the road, how we did it, why we did it, uh, and what we got out of it. Um, at the same time, giving a hint of some of the, the the more difficult moments, but it was all worth it. We loved it. That's why we did it. So, thank you very, very much, Chris. It was just fantastic talking to you and. Thank you all for listening and please subscribe to the Fingal's Cave podcast to make sure you can easily tune in to our upcoming episodes. And thank you, Ian, I, Ian I, for being on my side. I will do that. And listen, just before we go, just so, I, just so we, we don't have to prove each other's ID, just, this thing has been featured on the web page as well. And it's my collection of passes from wow. the Tour. And you see right on the top there is my crew pass and my tour pass. Just so oh, lovely to have a photo of that later on. Well, you've got it there. But this is all the second book. This is all the stuff that's uh, designed for the second book. Um, you know, all those pictures. I've got a lot of memorabilia. There's stuff I'd love to show you, uh, but we just don't have time. Pictures here behind me. There's pictures there of you too and all sorts of people hang on there um i'd love to show you that we don't have time for but maybe later see how we go get to the second book we talk again all thank right. you very much all thank right you, all the best. thanks both for your time I, I it's honest. been great speaking to you very appreciative talk to you soon nils stay in touch okay bye bye.